Video games are an awesome place to draw inspiration for your tabletop and wargaming terrain builds, and today I'm going to show you some really affordable, beginner-friendly projects to sink your teeth into, inspired by a game I've been looking forward to playing for years. My name's Guy, you're watching Midwinter Minis, and this video has been sponsored by Atomic Heart. I've made no secret of the fact that I'm not only a big tabletop wargaming fan, I love video games, and I've used some of my favourite games like Fallout, Deus Ex, Half-Life and System Shock 2 to influence my imagination when it comes to scratch building my tabletop terrain pieces. Places like Megaton in Fallout 3, a sprawling walled junk town built from salvaged airliners that fell from the sky in the crater of an unexploded nuclear bomb. That absolutely inspires my creativity. The cramped, neon slum hive of Golem City in Mankind Divided. Yeah, obviously I want to make that, but it might be a bit hard to get your hands in to move your models around without accidentally godzilla your terrain to bits. The dimly lit Spartan cyberpunk atmosphere of the starship Von Braun in System Shock 2, with its lurking horrors and ominous graffiti, really tickles my tabletop dungeon crawler lust, and I'd love to make a Space Hulk System Shock crossover board at some point. But like I said, a game I've been looking forward to since… well, since this channel first started pretty much, has just been released. Atomic Heart is a first-person action RPG that is set in a similar way to the Fallout series being set in the retro-futuristic post-apocalyptic USA, Atomic Heart is set in the imaginary future of a mid-century Soviet-era Russia, and consequently the design choices and general aesthetic are a cool mix of quite stark constructivism and very beautiful Art Nouveau, pushed in more technologically advanced ways. Now, wherever you are in the game, whether it's the factories or secret labs or just wandering around the open world, there's a lot of concrete. So let me show you a really easy, cheap way to make modular concrete tiles to spice up your tabletop games. When I was planning this project, I played around with a few ways of doing this, some pushing the definition of beginner friendly, and it was only when I was sanding my way too flaky, way too heavy plaster slabs did it slap me in the face. Can I not just use the sandpaper? Yes. Yes, I could. The first step is to cheat and buy some cheap tiles that are the right size. These are 6 inch thin square cake boards, cheap as chips, pretty robust and great for using as a base. Next, sandpaper. I bought a pack of medium grit squares, and each one has enough surface area to cover two of the tiles. I think medium grit, or 70 grit in this exact case, is your best bet for scale accurate concrete. Get your cake board squared in the corner, mark out the edges, then with the smooth paper side face up, use a hard edge and a craft knife to lightly score the paper along the lines. Don't cut down too hard because you don't want to blunt your knife on the sandpaper, we're just trying to get through the first layer here, and then it'll be easy to rip. Nice, yeah, just pops away. Add some PVA glue to the unfinished side of the cake board, and slap your sandpaper down. Then, to stop it lifting, and to stop the board from warping, lay something like a heavy book on top, and even some extra weights if you have them. After an hour or so, it should be totally dry and ready for the next step. Now, obviously, you can just leave them as big blank slabs, but I'm going to make them a bit more visually interesting. I marked out each edge at the 2 inch and 4 inch marks, and drew a line across. Basically, I'm going to make a concrete version of the popular 40k Zone Mortalis floor tiles. It's totally possible to score and mark the rough side of the sandpaper, but as I said, you don't really want to ruin your knives. Instead, use something hard and blunt, like a butter knife or the edge of a palette knife. The blunter the better, really. Score along the lines using a straight edge to guide you, and then once the cake board is visible under the lines, I grabbed a dead biro and punched some little machining holes down into the corners of each tile, just eyeballing a couple of millimetres from the edge. Yeah, I mean, it's not perfect, but it'll look fine once it's painted, and we're going to do that right now. First, prime the whole thing with grey spray paint, and as these tiles are pretty light, I also blue tack the edges down to stop them moving around as I painted too. For the first step, mix grey and a light yellow paint together. Concrete takes on the colour of the sand or ballast that's mixed in, and that's very often warm and yellow toned. Thin it down and use a big brush to do rough, messy streaks, but making sure that they all go in the same direction, either left to right or top to bottom, and don't cover everything, leave some of that primer showing. Use a sheet of paper or card to mask off some of the tile edges, and then stipple and smush your brush around the edge to give the illusion that some of the tiles are lighter than others. Yeah, nice focusing there, camera. The back of my hand is super important, after all. Leave that step to dry for a few minutes. If you're working on multiple tiles, the first should be done by the time you finish your last. Get a bit of moisture on your brush, and just dampen the surface lightly. And now grab some of your favourite washes. 
blacks, browns, greys and greens if you've got them will work really well. If you don't have dedicated washes, just dilute regular model paints with about 5 to 7 parts water to 1 part paint. Now use a pipette or dropper bottles to add random dots of wash here and there. Black here, brown here, a bit of green. Ooh, <laughs> a lot of green it seems. Now get your brush moist again and then, in the opposite direction you painted the streaks, brush up and down in straight lines until the dots are smoothed out into a big, stainy mess. Now don't worry if it looks over the top, the washes will dry pretty tame and quite transparent. And when they're dry, go back to the masking and stippling step, either with a piece of torn sponge or just your brush again, and add a bit more of that yellowy grey mix right from the start. Add some more streaks as well if you think it needs it. And now just using the light yellow paint, AK's ice yellow in this case, I did some light dry brushing to catch the texture of the sandpaper, which is now much softer and less abrasive after all these paint layers. And again, masked off some tile edges with paper to focus on lifting and adding highlights to certain edges while keeping the neighboring tiles dark. Now, by the way, if you haven't got a light yellow paint like this, just add a tiny bit of yellow into some white and you'll have what you need. You can leave it like this, or if you want, you can add a few subtle cracks. To inspire you, just do an image search for concrete cracks and copy your favourite ones with some black wash and a fine tipped brush. Don't go overboard, just a few here and there will really sell the effect. For a final extra step, you could use your light yellow paint again here to highlight just the underside of the cracked edges to simulate light catching them, and also catch a couple of the tile edges and corners, especially where the contrast is maybe a bit low and it looks dull. And there you go. Boom. Easy concrete tiles that take minutes to make, are super easy to store, and are really affordable. In fact, let's work it out. 35p for the sandpaper, 70p for the board, and let's say 50p of paint and glue use? Tops. That's £1.50 per tile, and that was also buying stuff in really small quantities. If you wanted to make more, you could no doubt get that even cheaper. Not bad at all. Right, what's next? Well, from having a good go of Atomic Heart, I know that the open world is littered with abandoned vehicles. Some in good working condition, and others absolutely wrecked. Cheap, scale-appropriate vehicles are going to be kind of costly to make or buy for this, right? Wrong. I've got two words for you, my friend. Broken toys eBay and Facebook Marketplace are packed with broken toy bundles, and you might even have some little scamps of your own or friends with kids whose toys you can repurpose once they lose interest or get damaged. A couple of months ago, I accidentally stepped on my kid's toy tractor. They leave stuff everywhere, and I don't have eyes in the back of my head. Ordinarily, I would try to fix it, but it's absolutely buckled to bits. The axles are bent, the frame is squashed, the back wheel broke off. Sorry kiddos, this is daddy's toy now. The first thing you want to do is snip off any bits that make whatever you're using the wrong scale, like seats or steering wheels, but actually this tractor looks like it could easily have a heroic scale human sitting in it, so we'll just leave it at that. I'll still snip off any connecting nubs that look toy-like though. For the base I'm using medium weight chipboard, which is like the thick card stuff you get on the back of paper pads. It's cheap, easy to cut, takes paint and glue really well, and is pretty warp resistant, which makes it good for small terrain bits like this. Once I was happy with the vague placement of the bits, I drew a little border around them and then cut out the bases with scissors. To glue the bits down, you can use super glue if you like, but I'm going to be using a hot glue gun, an essential tool for a scrap terrain builder in my book. To add realistic low cost ground texture to the base, I mixed some random stones, a bit of sand and some table dust and trimmings from building plastic and MDF models into a little mixing cup, and then I added a big glob of black craft paint until it behaved like a really thick paint and not moist gravel, if you know what I mean. Also ignore the random bases of the coins stuck to them, that'll make sense later. I painted it straight onto the base and brushed a bit onto the tractor itself for some caked on dirt. And then I gave everything a little salt bay style flourish of sand for a final texture layer. Wow! I left it to dry overnight, and then the next day I primed it with grey spray paint. A light dusting in all directions will do, even on the underside to get some paint on the bottom of the base, and this will help the chipboard not to warp in the future. Remembering to keep things in the Atomic Heart aesthetic, most of the vehicles are quite pale, desaturated, pastel-y colours, so I think a good base coat for this tractor will be Gauss Blaster Green. I wanted this colour to be quite subtle, so I applied a couple of very thin coats, diluted with water until it looked the right shade, and then mixed in a bit of that ice yellow we used before to the green we just used, and overbrushed that all over. This will help highlight the top facing sections and pick out the soft textures. Most of the vehicles in Atomic Heart sport a simple horizontal line stylistic touch, so I'm going to add this to the tractor too. 
with if masking tape on each side, top and bottom, with a little line showing in the middle. Not too much paint on your brush, and I'm using a deep red in this case, and a lightly dab and stipple the area until it's covered. Whip off the tape and take a look at how badly you did. No worries, we can tidy up that edge and any of the paint that bled under the tape with some of the base colour once that strip has dried. And yeah, there we go. It doesn't have to be perfect, it's junk terrain after all. I then switched out to a gunmetal silver to base coat all the wheel hubs, the undercarriage, inside the cockpit, and the edge of any damaged, snapped off bits. I then used a deep, very dark grey to paint the tyres. I chose to do them grey because if we paint them straight black, then it wouldn't really darken it. Now, not wanting to get too many paints involved, I added a touch of that German grey to the deep red I used for the stripe and painted the upholstery of the chair. I mixed brown and black wash into the same quantity of water to thin it down and then slopped it on all over every part of the terrain piece. While I waited for that to dry, I gave the base a similar treatment to the concrete tiles we just made, so a slightly yellowed grey overbrush and then a few drops of random coloured washes spread out with a moist brush. And when that was all dry, I gave the entire model, base and all, a gentle dry brush with that ice yellow to pick out the textures and accent some sharp edges. A little extra bit of thinned black wash on the base to make the areas around the junk look a bit more shadowy, and yeah, then we're done. As an optional extra, if you've got any grass tufts, this would be a cool time to add them. A dot of super glue and squish them in random places and groups. These are from Gamers Grass and look pretty realistic when you give them a bit of a squash and a snip to rough them up. Boom, there we go. A ruined, abandoned vehicle, ready to add some ominous scene setting to your tabletop, and for super, super cheap. I mean, let's figure it out. Assuming you consider the value of the toy so broken it was just going to be binned as zero, we spent about 20p on the chipboard, and no more than 40p on the tiny amount of glue, primer, and paint we used. So, 60p? Nice. Even if you had to spend a couple of quid on buying a broken toy, it would still be worth it for something that looks this cool, surely. Now that's two down, two to go. Before we crack on with the next one though, let me tell you more about Atomic Heart for a minute. They have sponsored the video after all, it would only be polite. So I gave you an idea of the setting of the game at the start, and I remember seeing some promo videos of the game in its development stage, what, five years ago? And I thought it looked too good to be true. Well, more fool me, because now I've played it and it looks as good as the promos. The gameplay is also really fun. I'm only a few hours into the campaign at the moment, but it already ticks so many boxes for me. There's an engaging story, there's action, there's creepy design, there's puzzles, all tied together with some good old fashioned virtual violence. There's apparently a 20 hour main storyline, and about 15 to 20 hours of side quests to deal with. The enemies in this game are also hard as nails, particularly before you start upgrading your cheeky little AI glove with new tricks. But there's three difficulty modes to suit the way you play. To fully immerse myself in the setting, I chose to play it with the Russian voiceovers and English subtitles, and the game's launching with 9 voiceover and 13 subtitle languages from the get-go. It's pretty impressive. Atomic Heart is made by a company called Munfish, and you won't have heard of them because crazily this is their first game, and man, what an amazing job. It's out now on PC, Xbox One, PS4, and it's even been optimised for the Steam Deck too, so go grab a copy now. Follow the link in the description to let them know that I sent you. Also, this woman totally looks like the Queen, right? Now speaking of puzzle bits, one of the most striking things in the game for me aesthetically were these giant magnetic wall things that shapeshift rooms. They should also be pretty easy to make, and a great way to show you one of my favourite methods for junk terrain building. All you need is foam board, some coffee stirrers, and some corrugated paper or card. Rather than go into this with specific dimensions in mind, let's just work with the materials and make it easy for ourselves. These coffee stirrers are just over 5 inches long, so I cut the ends off them to square them off and also make them exactly 5 inches. I spent a few minutes dry fitting the stirrers on the foam board to find a shape I was comfortable with, I'm going for a bordered look on all of the faces on the box, and then I marked off where the edges of the foam board will be. Join up your edges, and then grab your craft knife or box cutter and use a straight edge to do a few light passes on the foam board to cleanly cut it. Foam board is pretty stiff foam sandwiched between two thick sheets of paper. Basically, a few gentle cuts should get all the way through it nice and easy. We want another face exactly this shape, so I just use this face as a template and cut it out again. To make the shallower sides, I'm just going to use half a 5 inch coffee stirrer as my guide, so it'll be the same height as the two main panels, but only 2.5 inches wide. Two of those cut out, and we're ready to start sticking. As with the tractor, I'm going to be using hot glue for this. Now, if your glue gun has two power settings, turn it onto the lower power setting so it doesn't melt the foam too aggressively if it touches it. 
You can also use PVA glue if you don't have a hot glue gun. A handy tip for this is to use toothpicks to make little locking teeth to hold the walls in place while it dries. Anyway, stick, stick, stick. And then once you've got your four-sided box, place it down on some more foam board to trace the shape of the lids. Now you know the drill by now, cut them out, stick them on. We don't want too many bumps and bulges of hot glue on the surface before we start texturing it, so run the tip of your hot glue gun over any blobs to remelt them and smear them out with a flat piece of scrap. Right then, let's lay down our border coffee stirrer design with PVA glue. Paper and wood will stick really fast with PVA, which is handy. Now I'm going to fill in all the blank spaces on the front, back and sides with corrugated paper. The cheatiest way to do this is to cut the right width you need, lay the paper where you want it, and then mark out where the last bump would fit into the frame you've made, then cut it and stick it. Easy. I gave all the corners a light going over with sandpaper to get rid of any sharp bits, and then it's prime time. Even though it's had a light priming of grey, I'm also going to give it a quick coat of PVA glue mixed with black craft paint. This thing is probably going to have models walking all over it in battle reports, so we want the surface to harden a bit and put up with wear and tear over the years. It'll also leave the recesses nice and dark. Once that's done, a quick sponging with grey paint will start to reveal the texture. A lighter sponging with some metallic gunmetal paint will make it more visually interesting. And the borders were painted grey to make them pop a little bit. And now let's make each end look like brushed steel. Here's a super cheaty speed paint technique to add to your arsenal. Dilute your grey paint with water. Paint it from one side to the other in one direction only with a fat flat brush. And then, while it's still wet, get some white paint on the tip of your brush. Dab it diagonally across the center. Clean your brush, dry it on a towel, and then sweep your brush back and forth in the same direction as you painted the grey until it smooths into a subtle shine. Once that's dry, do a really light streaky overbrush with a lighter grey to add some scratches and brush marks, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I gave the rest of the wall a dry brush with a lighter grey too, and you could call it done here, but to take a design cue from Atomic Hearts, they have this cool magnetic directional symbol on them, so let's make a basic version of that. I laid my wall down on some paper and cut out the shape of the largest face to use as a mask. I drew out opposing arrows and then cut them out with a blade. This way I can lay it on top, give it a quick blast of spray paint, safe in the knowledge it's not going anywhere I don't want it to, except my lungs. Nice! I added a little bit of scratchy highlighting to the yellow designs with ice yellow, and then sponged on some grey to give it a bit of weathering as if the paint is chipped off. Nailed it! A really impressive, huge terrain piece to hide your models behind and block line of sight, even for great big war machines. Now how much did it cost? I used half a foam board sheet, so that's £1.50, around 20p for the stirrers, one and a half sheets of that corrugated paper, that's about 70p, and there was quite a lot of surface to paint, so let's say £1 for the glue and paint. So what, £3.40 for this huge monolithic terrain piece? Not bad at all. Once you master foam board construction though, the wargaming world is your oyster. Shipping containers, fortresses, junk towns. In my battle reports you might have seen these foam board post-apocalyptic stackable shanties, and they were one of my first ever DIY builds when I got back into wargaming. Give it a try, I bet you'll be surprised how easy it is. Right, last DIY terrain build, and this one is a bit quirky. The main aspect of Atomic Heart is this weird material called polymer. It's integral to the story, but you can also swim in it, which is fun. Translucent, slightly iridescent things are really hard to make on a budget without expensive resins and fancy techniques, but let's give it a go. Grab your empty drinks bottles out of the recycling. We're going to be recycling the old-fashioned way today. Cut them up into useful, smaller chunks. Cut out some bases to make some polymer blobs on. Just the same chipboard we used for the tractor will be fine. Now the actual build will be almost weightless, but I might end up making it quite tall, so I weighed down the bases with a few 1 and 2p coins, so that's 11p blown on the budget already. We've really hit the big time now. Mixing up some of that texture paint again and slop it on the bases. After that's dry, prime them and paint them like we did with the other floor elements in this project to tie everything in, and then we can go about making some polymer blobs to sit on them. Lay a little trail of hot glue down, leave it for a second, and then stick some plastic bottle clippings down. Go around the base and make whatever shape you want. Add a little bit more on top and start connecting them up until you've made a really janky looking structure with a closed top. You could use super glue for this, but it would be a bit more brittle and prone to breaking than with hot glue. If you've got any nasty sharp edges sticking out, snip them off and make it all a bit smoother, and then we can move on to the next step. More cheap, transparent material. Yoohoo glue 
and a sandwich bag. Cut the sandwich bag into manageable size sheets, maybe no bigger than your hand for each slice, and then smear some yuhu glue all over the junk plastic structure, and then smooth out the sandwich bag sheet over the top. Do it again and again until all of the plastic bottle is covered by at least two sheets of sandwich bag. Leave it to dry for a few minutes to make sure the plastic sheets won't come off, and then add another layer of yuhu glue and smear it all over. This should lock down the shape a little bit more and make it look a bit less plastic bag-like and also harden the surface. When that step is dry, paint a layer of PVA glue onto the whole surface. PVA hates sticking to plastic, so it will pull together and form these little clumps, adding a bobbly surface texture when it dries. To add a little bit of visual spice, I'm going to use some of these holographic nail flakes. I've used them on models before to give a fancy iridescent effect, but I reckon it'll work really well here. As the PVA is drying and still a bit tacky, I used an earbud to scoop up some of the flakes and then press them onto the surface. Regular glitter would do if you don't have any of these nail flakes, but they're really cool and you should totally get some anyway. And there we go, a pretty simple but strikingly weird terrain piece. Light shines through it in a really nice way and it's not often you get to play with transparent terrain pieces on the tabletop. Again, the bottles were just going in the recycling, so free, essentially 20p for the chipboard, maybe 40p for the paint and glue, and what, 10p for the tiny amount of nail flakes I used, if I'm being over generous with the guessing. That's 70p for two cool little terrain pieces. Not bad at all. Oh, uh, I almost forgot, 11p in coins, 81p. So that's four fun, easy, beginner-friendly, and above all, cheap tabletop terrain projects inspired by Atomic Heart. But you know what? I'm not quite done yet. While the environments, level design, and general aesthetic of Atomic Heart are fantastic, it would be a disservice to not mention the totally awesome robot designs. They come in all shapes and sizes, and one of my favourites is this little boy here, MFU-68. Before all the robots rebelled, these things were loggers and shepherds, but now they're hell-bent on chopping you off at the knees. Anyway, you know what I'm thinking, right? Kibash time. I grabbed my bits box and raided it for useful-looking mechanical bits armor plates, legs, and blades. And among the unbuilt sponson parts and unused vehicle options, I found one set of orc killer can legs and a spare saw from a death dread. I think I can make this work. I don't want it to look overly orky though, so I snipped off the spikes and hooks. I've got a couple of these Land Raider sponson covers here, and that will make a pretty good opening for the saw to come out of on the torso. So let's get rid of the Imperium iconography, and with the edges cut off one of them, I made a nice front and top section. I built up the killer can legs, but cut the spikes off them too. These little weapon pod covers from a Stormhawk gunship, I think, would make decent sides, and the Land Raider sponson shelf should make a nice base. I glued on two little terrain light fittings as the eyes, and I snipped up this Necromunda crate to fill the gaps in the back, and used offcuts of the handle to make details on the front. Another terrain light fitting to bridge the gap on the underside of the model, and some off-cut plastic wedges to fill those wide gaps at the front. Now this strip from a Torox detail should fit this gap perfectly. More light fittings to mount the legs on to give them some space from the body. It won't matter it's the same part we used for the eyes as you won't be able to see the main sections for the thigh. Some little plastic off-cuts give it some eyebrows. <laughs> oh well, at least the gaps are covered. I stuck the legs on, keeping the body in place with some blue tack to stop it falling over. And then I glue the saw blade on. And now let's get it stuck down. The feet are actually a part of an optional arm build for a Blood Angel's Dreadnought, I think. <laughs> Look at him, isn't he the cutest? Made entirely from scrap. Unused parts in my bits box. Never throw away your bits, people. Clip off the spares from your sprues and keep them. You never know what madness you'll need them for in the future. Let's give him a super quick speed paint. Gray primer. Lots of muted greens on the body armor, a very light metallic dry brush, and an all-over wash. I added some simple red glowy OSL for the eyes by base coating the lenses white and dry brushing areas around the eyes white as well. And then I added layers of red ink in a glaze to make it a more rich red. I gave the little yellow pipes a quick highlight and yeah, a pretty good representation of Atomic Heart's ubiquitous MFU-68 rendered in the world of Warhammer 40k. I'm 100% going to use this as an attack squid for my favourite war boss, and it's 100% Games Workshop parts, so there's not a thing a tournament organiser could do to stop me. <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed this fun little DIY scratch build and kit bash video. 
I'd love to do more stuff like this in the future. Is there a game you want me to try to build stuff from? Let me know in the comments. I'll leave some links in the description for specific hobby tools I used, just in case you want to treat yourself to something like a new glue gun or even some fancy nail flakes. Lastly, obviously, don't forget to check out Atomic Heart. The link that let them know I sent you is in the video description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.